So today what we're going to do is we're going to take our first departure from actually talking about GR okay, towards something that's well more speculative but in some sense we understand a little bit about it and we're starting to see more and more of the pieces okay. And uh, so the most surprising thing is that the black holes that we have learned about okay which obey the classical principles of general relativity which are essentially just solutions to vacuum equations. Somehow surprisingly these same vacuum solutions seem like they behave exactly like thermodynamic systems okay. And thermodynamic systems are complicated okay in the sense well uh, something in thermal equilibrium is as simple as it can be but only if you zoom out of it and just look at its coarse properties. So in the same sense a black hole appears to be exactly like that okay when we if we think of it just we are just looking at the coarse properties then it seems to behave exactly like a thermodynamic system okay. But we will see that thinking of black holes as thermodynamic systems although the analogy seems to work very well it leads to a number of paradoxes okay and we will try to understand what those paradoxes are. So let us start with what we learnt about Kerr black holes and uh, we saw that the area of a Kerr black hole is equal to we had written it in terms of so the Kerr black hole is spe specified by two parameters it is uh, mass and it is angular momentum or equivalently mass and A where A is J by M. Okay, so the area of a Kerr black hole is uh, something we worked out last time. We write it in terms of something called the irreducible mass, where this irreducible mass is now a function of this m and a. Okay, and we've written down a formula for what m irreducible is. M irreducible uh, square is equal to half m square plus m by g into square root g square m square minus a square okay. And we are assuming our black hole is sub extremal so that uh, g m is greater than 0 okay. And those seem to be the only realistic black hole solutions which do not have a naked singularity. So the other thing that we saw is now if we consider a Penrose process in which we try to change the mass and angular momentum of the black hole by throwing something in okay then we can change the irreducible mass or equivalently the area okay and we have written down a formula for the change in uh, the irreducible mass uh, when I change m and uh, the angular momentum a or equivalently j okay. So you can show by differentiating this equation, uh, this equation that delta m irreducible is equal to 1 over 4 g m irreducible into a over omega h g square m square minus a square into delta m minus omega h. And we argued that in a Penrose process delta omega minus omega h delta j has to be positive okay or at least non negative. So uh, this is greater than 0 okay for any physical process okay. In a Penrose process in particular delta m is negative and delta j is negative okay and uh, sorry delta m is negative and omega h delta j is negative okay but the sum of these two is strictly greater than okay and so what that means is that in any physical process okay where I throw stuff into the black hole uh, and maybe I extract some energy out the irreducible mass never decreases and therefore the area never decreases okay so the area is always uh, strictly non decreasing. So now what we can do is we can instead of writing the change in m okay irreducible as a function of delta m and delta j we can equivalently write it in terms of the area itself okay. So we can write directly what is delta a okay as I change uh, delta m and delta j. So delta a is equal to 8 pi g a over omega h 
sorry, and I should just write down again what omega h is. Omega h is the angular velocity of the black hole, which is a over r plus square, uh, plus a square, where r plus is gm plus square root g square m square which is Okay, it's the outer event horizon. Okay, so this over square root Okay, so not not surprising. Okay, I mean it's just uh, you differentiate this, you get 32 pi g square m irreducible times delta m, and then you substitute for delta m irreducible, you get the formula for delta a. Okay, but now what we'll do is let let us recast this equation. Okay. And we'll write delta m on one side. We'll write it the change in the mass of a black hole in terms of the change in its area and the change in its angular momentum. Okay, so we'll write delta m is the square root of g square m square minus a square over 8 pi g Okay, so still nothing surprising here. And the only thing that we've argued is for any physical process, oh actually, yeah, no, I shouldn't say any physical process, any Penrose process, okay. This is uh, positive. Any Penrose process. where I'm trying to extract energy from the black hole, okay. This will be uh, first for any Penrose process delta A will be strictly non-decreasing, non uh, A will be strictly non-decreasing. Okay, now the thing about a curved black hole which we haven't shown, okay, I'll just write this as an aside. Uh, this, we can write down a formula for the surface gravity of a curved black hole. Okay. So for this what we need to do is we need to find the surface gravity at the outer event horizon. Okay. So the outer event horizon is located at r is r plus. What is the killing vector that becomes null on this outer event horizon? Right, good. So it's this killing vector, chi, which is k mu plus omega h r mu. k mu is the time-like killing vector at infinity, r mu is the rotational killing vector field. This linear combination is null at r is equal to r plus, okay. And the definition of surface gravity was that uh, you have del uh, chi mu, del mu chi nu. This chi is a null vector field, okay, and it generates null geodesics on the on the killing horizon, okay, and this should be equal to minus kappa chi nu, okay. So this is basically just the geodesic equation, and the fact that kappa is non-zero is because the geodesic may not be finely parameterized, okay, given the value of chi. So kappa is the surface gravity. Okay, and kappa can be calculated uh, and uh, we had shown that, well, it was actually a homework exercise to show that you can calculate kappa as minus half del mu chi nu, del mu chi nu. Okay, so given the metric and given the scaling vector field, okay, it's a straightforward exercise to calculate kappa, kappa although it's, it's a bit cumbersome, okay, you can probably do it in some numerical pack, I mean, sorry, a symbolic manipulation package. Okay, so at the end when you do this, okay, you can calculate kappa and you can find, uh, you will find that kappa, write this over here, you will find this formula for kappa, kappa is equal to uh, exactly this, okay, square root g square 
m squared minus a squared uh, times omega h. Okay. Remember, all of these things, omega h depends only on a, uh, a and m, okay, or a and g m. Okay. So, the surface gravity should only be a property of a and g m, okay, or is only a function of those quantities. So, it is some constant. Okay, so we haven't done this tedious exercise, but okay, we should try to work this out. Okay, but when you do this, at the end, uh, what you get is that this kappa is exactly what shows up here. So this is the surface gravity of the black hole by eight pi g times delta a plus omega h. So this is the key equation and when you look at this equation, it is starting to look a little bit like a thermodynamic equation, okay. So uh, looks like a thermodynamic equation, in what sense, okay. In the sense that, let us recall the first law of thermodynamics. That is, if I have a system in which I change the energy of the system, changing the energy of the system is like changing the mass of the black hole, because that is all the energy of the system, okay, including its uh, whatever energy you have, include plus its rotational energy, all of that is inside, encoded inside m. This is equal to, in a thermodynamic system, T times the change in entropy, okay, minus pressure times the change in volume. Okay, the generic idea is that you have some uh, energy functional E, which is extensive, which can be expressed in terms of other extensive parameters like S and V. These are extensive. Okay. So, what it means for the system to be extensive is that if I scale the entropy by some lambda and if I scale the volume by some lambda, then the energy of the system should just be equal to lambda times the energy of a system with entropy S and volume. Okay. That is what it means for the energy to be extensive. Okay. To scale, it's, uh, it scales as a first order uh, polynomial okay, in this parameter lambda. Okay. The other thing is that these uh, parameters T, okay, uh, and P are intensive parameters. They do not scale with system size, okay. So, even if I scale up the entropy and the volume, the temperature and the pressure will not scale and the temperature can be expressed as partially partial S at constant volume and minus of the pressure can be expressed as partial V, partial E. Uh, sorry, uh, partial E, partial V, okay, at constant entry. Okay. So, these are intensive parameters and in the way we are looking at it, we are treating S and V as the independent variable. So, our temperature will be uh, some function of S and V, okay, and our pressure will be some function of S and V. Okay. Of course, it is possible to perform uh, Legendre transforms and trade, uh, okay, these variables for other variables or trade an extensive variable for an intensive variable. Now, this equation is only, it should be thought of as representative of a generic thermodynamic system. In a generic thermodynamic system, you have these generalized pressures, okay, times delta V i, okay. So, for example, if you have rotational energy in the system, okay, uh, this generalized pressure will be like some angular velocity, okay, and this delta V i will be some generalized angular momentum. So that if you imagine integrating this over some process, okay, this generalized angular momentum is roughly going to be something like moment of inertia times omega. If the moment of inertia is not changing, it is only omega that is changing, then when I integrate this, I get half i omega square and that is exactly what you would expect as the change in the energy 
okay, that you produce as you speed up a, uh, a body, okay, and give it some uh, angular velocity. Okay, so this, so basically, when I say pressure times delta v, okay, this term over here is interpreted in terms of a generalized pressure in in that sense. Okay, so the idea is that this quantity is an intensive parameter that doesn't scale with system size, and this is an extensive parameter that scales with system size. Okay. Okay, so it's in that sense that you should really think of this as generalized thermodynamics, provided. Okay, so this term looks fine. Okay, it's exactly what you'd expect for a rotating body, but now we have to inter we have to make some analogy here, and the analogy is between interpreting delta a or a as the entropy of the system, and interpreting the surface gravity kappa, okay, as the temperature of the system. The thing is we do not know what is the right normalization, okay. We do not know how the area should be normalized when we wanted to interpret it as entropy and we do not know how the temperature should be normalized, okay, to interpret it as surface gravity. But up to a normalization factor, we our expectation is if black holes behave like thermodynamic systems, okay, then the following analogy must be true and let us write that down. So, if black holes uh, behave like thermodynamic systems, okay, we will see a couple of things is the energy of a, so here I am writing a thermodynamic quantity and here I am writing a black hole quantity. So, the energy of a thermodynamic system is like the mass of the black hole. The temperature, okay, is and I am going to be uh, uh, I am going to just write down a normalization here. I will just say that this is kappa by 2 pi, okay. Why this particular normalization? We will see, but this kappa by 2 pi is the thing we will identify as the temperature of the black hole, okay, where kappa is the surface gravity. Okay, and actually I should be uh, even more careful. Okay, we will see that, um, yeah, if I want to be more precise, okay, there will be some factor here, okay, which we do not know what that constant is. Okay, and the entropy is of the thermodynamic system is to be identified with the area over 4 g. So, whatever constant you put here, this must be 1 over that constant, so that the product, okay, still gives you exactly this. And so, sort of this generalized pressure is omega h and uh, the generalized volume, okay, is, uh, is j, okay. But this really should be thought of in the sense that even for normal rotating, rotating thermodynamic system, okay, this would really be omega h the rotational angular velocity of the system and this would be the angular momentum of that system, okay. So, the analogy is, is much more precise for this part, okay. Uh, it is less clear why this part should be interpreted as the entropy. Entropy and kappa is the temperature, okay. So, this is just, if you just look at this, we have not done anything here, okay. There is no physics here. We just looked at an equation, okay, in, in which comes out of general relativity. And we mapped it to an equation in thermodynamics and said, well, what if this is this and this is this and this is this, okay. Uh, okay. So, right now we do not really have any, any other motivation, okay. But let us see how far we can push this analogy. Okay, so let us recall the, the laws of thermodynamics one by one and try to see to what extent, okay, these, these would carry over. So, let us start with the most basic property which is just a statement about equilibrium, okay. 
a system in thermal system in thermal equilibrium will always relax into a stationary state described by a few effective parameters. Okay. So, for example, if I consider a gas, okay, it's it has a huge number of degrees of freedom, right? There, let's say Avogadro's number of particles, okay, in here, all moving around different positions, different velocities. But if I allow the system to come to thermal equilibrium, I allow collisions between them so that the particles can distribute their energy smooth o over each other, okay? Then, if I just coarse grain and just study the effective properties that are important for the system. Okay, when I look at it from far away or if I look at long time effects or long distance effects, okay, then the only things that matter are a few extensive properties like uh, the entropy, the volume, the number of particles and the energy. Okay. The energy turns out to be a function of, of these or you can think of the entropy as a function of these, either way it works, okay. And this is called a fundamental relation. The end result of achieving thermal equilibrium is that the system is described by a few simple parameters. So, to what extent does this hold for black holes? Well, for a black hole also when you throw things in, it might emit some gravitational waves. So, there will be perturbations to the metric, but then it ultimately relaxes into a very simple state, okay. And uh, the no hair theorem tells us that black holes will eventually settle to states which are only identified by their mass, uh, their angular momentum. Uh, and their area, okay, and uh, sorry, the mass, area, angular momentum, and uh, maybe some charge. Okay, and this e equation can be extended to charged black holes. Okay, so if you have charged black holes, ag again, it's sort of a thermodynamic uh, analogy. Okay, the extensive quantity is the charge, so it's delta Q. Okay, and the quantity that pops up here is the electrostatic potential, okay. Because phi, if I integrate this, then I would get the self energy, okay, of that black hole. Okay. So, uh, so that is it, okay. So, the Noah theorem also tells us something very similar that black holes are described by just a handful of, prop, uh, of properties, okay, which are extensive properties. And that is exactly what you would expect for systems in thermal equilibrium. Okay, the second uh, statement is that of the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which is that the temperature is constant throughout uh, the system. Okay, as if I place two bodies and allow them to relax to the state of thermal equilibrium. I do I, I remove a wall let us say which is partitioning two objects, uh, two gases, okay. I remove this wall, let, allow them to thermalize, then they will come to a single temperature, okay. And similarly, if I have a black hole, okay, and I drop stuff into it, ultimately it will settle down into a single black hole which will have a particular surface gravity which will be constant over the entire horizon, okay. So, kappa is constant. over the horizon. Okay, or at least this is true. Okay, again this is not a statement that we proved, okay, that kappa will be a constant. Okay, it's something that has, has to be proven. Kappa is a constant over the horizon. This is true for uh, stationary black holes. Uh, where the event horizon is a killing horizon. Third statement is the first law of thermodynamics, which we have already written down. Okay, where we interpret this as delta E 
is equal to T delta S plus some summation over generalized pressures and uh, delta volumes. Okay, and uh, the last, uh, sorry, the not the last. Okay, one more thing that we have is the second law of thermodynamics. states that the entropy is strictly non-decreasing, okay, in a closed, in an isolated system. Okay. And by analogy, we have seen that the area uh, of a black hole is strictly non-decreasing. Okay, and uh, the last postulate of thermodynamics is the third law, okay. And the third law simply states that it is impossible to achieve T is equal to 0, okay, uh, and uh, in any physical process. Okay, starting at some larger value of t, because as t goes to zero, the entropy okay goes to uh, zero. Okay, so this is an alternative way of of claiming this. Okay, this is as t goes to zero. If the entropy goes to zero, okay, then uh, then it it actually becomes impossible to go on lowering the temperature because you have to make the system more and more ordered. Okay, which means you have to keep reducing its entropy, which means you have to go on increasing the entropy somewhere else. Okay, and it turns out that it's actually impossible, then in any physical process, okay, to actually lower this temperature all the way uh, to zero. Okay, this law. Okay, so everything else seems to have an analogy for black holes. This law doesn't quite work because temperature is like kappa, okay, which is the surface gravity, and kappa is zero for extremal black holes. Okay, but the extremal black hole is the case when R plus is equal to R minus, which is equal to GM. Okay, that is the horizons meet, the inner horizon and the outer horizon meet. Okay, and in this case, therefore, since R plus is finite, the area will be finite. Okay, so if area is like entropy and kappa is like temperature, it means that you are saying that S of the black hole uh, is finite even when its temperature goes to 0. Okay. So, this last postulate which is uh, called the Nernst postulate okay, of thermodynamics, this is actually also violated even for known thermodynamic systems. Okay. Now, if you think about how it is that you can achieve some entropy when the temperature goes to zero, okay, let's think about it from a statistical mechanics point of view. Okay, so this the entropy going to zero means that I, for example, if I have some spins, okay, if the temperature goes to zero, what it means is then my system is in the ground state. Okay. So, if the ground state is unique, then there is only one ground state that you can be in and that ground state basically is, is some particular state. Okay. Let us imagine that it is a perfectly ordered state, okay. for example, like this. Okay. If this is a, un if there is a unique ground state, okay. uh, sorry, let, let me imagine something like this, okay, where neighboring spins have to be opposite. Okay. So, if there is a unique ground state, uh, then my entropy, which is minus P i log P i sum over my possible configurations means there is only one term and there is a probability of one of being in this particular ground state and no probability of being in anything else, the entropy is just 0. Okay. But if the ground state is not unique, there are many possible ground states, then I have a probability of being in either one or the other. Okay. And uh, you can also imagine being in a superposition of them in a, quant a quantum mechanical system, okay, which would correspond to being entangled 
between your system and your environment degrees of freedom ok. So, in all such cases ok uh, you have known systems which violate the Nernst postulate ok and black holes if the analogy of thermodynamics uh, applies to black holes, black holes also appear to be such systems ok uh, which violate this this third law. Uh, sir. Yeah. So, like uh, uh, you mean like uh, if uh, for a system there is a uh, there is a unique ground state then we can argue that the entropy is 0. The entropy is 0 because as t goes to 0 no as t goes to 0 the entropy is 0 because as t goes to 0 you you will have to go to the ground state right and if the ground state is unique there is no way to have any disorder in the system. If it is not unique then entropy will be non zero. In principle it is possible ok. So, ok. So, we have to be a little bit careful about what we what we mean by entropy, but I will give you a simple example ok. So, imagine that there is a system with two possible ground states ok. So, it can be uh, let us say ground state 1 ok. So, this describes some collection of those spins ok which is and ground state 2 ok. And uh, and let us imagine that in a quantum mechanical system this is coupled to some environment degrees of freedom where your environment will register that you are in ground state 1 ok and here your environment registers that you are in ground state 2 ok. So, such a system ok is uh, is entangled with the environment, but if I only measure the properties of the system it will appear to have some entropy ok and that entropy we will talk about this maybe later ok is what is called fine grained entropy ok. That means that if this is really the state of the system ok there really is this inherent quantum mechanical uncertainty in what which state the system is in ok because it is entangled with the environment ok. So, if I am just looking at the the ground state degrees of freedom that is if I look at this state psi ok this defines a density matrix ok of uh, of the state that I am in ok. This is a pure state ok when I look at the environment and the system together. But now if I trace over uh, over the environment ok that is if I do not care what the environment is doing and I just look at this row ok then I get row of the system ok and essentially this is like saying there is a probability p 1 of being in ground state 1 and there is a probability p 2 of being in ground state 2. So, this entropy in this case is actually the entropy associated with such a system is actually an inherent property ok you, it, it cannot go away, but there could be another kind of entropy associated with what is called coarse grain entropy ok which is someone gives you a system and there is you are parameterizing the entropy as your unknown information about that system ok in the sense that I give you the system and this is either in ground state 1 or in ground state 2 ok forget quantum mechanics imagine that this is purely classical. Okay. There is some probability p 1 that it is in this state, probability p 2 that it is in this state ok and your entropy is just parameterizing your degree of ignorance about, okay, about which state you are in ok. Uh, but this such a case is called coarse grain entropy in the sense that ok I sort of do not know which of these configurations I am in ok and that is a degree of ignorance ok. But in principle if I remove that ignorance I would know which ground state I am in and then the entropy the, the true fine grain entropy is exactly 0. In this case, the true fine grained entropy of the system is actually finite, ok. You do not really know whether uh, you cannot know, ok, without measuring the environment degree of freedom, you cannot really know whether that system is in state 1 or state 2. That is a fundamental quantum mechanical uncertainty, ok. So, yeah, so, so this distinction between fine grained and coarse grained entropy, ok, will be, uh, will be somewhat important, ok, maybe, uh, but not right now, ok. So, uh, so, as we shall see, ok, this is the plan for the next few lectures is to, is to see this. Hawking showed uh, precisely what those constants are. He showed that P, the temperature of a black hole, is kappa by 2 pi times h bar by c, c being the speed of light, ok. Uh, and the entropy is equal to uh, 1 by 4 a by g c cube by h bar ok. So, one of the surprises of course, is that h bar 
enters okay into these equations which is already a clue that I mean anything that we wrote down for black hole thermodynamics seems purely classical. But when I try to work out what the temperature or the entropy of a black hole actually are, we see that h bar actually enters into the result okay those unknown constants. And this therefore is an indicator that the black hole entropy Uh, and temperature okay, arise from quantum mechanics. Uh, or from quantum mechanical effects. Okay. So, if this analogy is correct, okay, then somehow the temperature and entropy of a black hole have to arise from quantum mechanics. And that is exactly what Hawking showed and that is how we got this result okay is uh, that when you consider quantum mechanics and general relativity together it inevitably leads to the result that black holes have a temperature given by that uh, result okay. And uh, Bekenstein proposed a generalized second law okay which is uh, which is more general which is you looking at this analogy of black holes with thermodynamics he said that the total entropy. So, if you imagine a black hole plus something outside the black hole plus stuff okay. So, imagine a gas cloud or an astronaut okay uh, whatever that is the total entropy of the system which is the entropy of the uh, of the stuff okay. So, example if you have a gas cloud whatever entropy it has plus the entropy of the black hole where this entropy of the black hole is, is here. Okay, this whole thing, okay, is non-decreasing, okay, in any in any physical process. In any physical process where the black hole plus stuff is not interacting with something else, so that as long as it behaves like a closed system, okay, it cannot lower its entropy. So, in particular if I take this stuff to be everything outside the black hole, so the entire universe plus the black hole okay, then it is not the entropy of the stuff that separately has to remain uh, non decreasing or the entropy of the black hole that is separately non decreasing, it is the sum of the two that is non decreasing as a whole okay. So, either of these could decrease uh, uh, while the other one increases. Okay, but the total okay must always be non-decreasing in any physical process. Okay, for a closed system. Okay, and this law can actually be proven under a variety of assumptions. Okay, so so far what we have done is we've looked at the thermodyn an analogy between black holes and thermodynamics. Now that if we accept this analogy and we accept that okay there is some truth to this analogy, we'll see how it leads to certain paradoxes. Okay, and then I mean everything else that's currently going on in this field is to resolve those paradoxes. Okay, so we'll let's try to what we'll try to do is not look at the resolutions, but rather our goal is to try to understand what is the paradox of treating black holes as thermodynamic systems. So, the first statement is if black holes 
have entropy then we know that the source of entropy okay at least for systems that we are familiar with is that the entropy is only a coarse grain property of a system okay. What it really is telling us is there is some unknown underlying behavior of the system okay which is given by uh, some uh, so it is parameterized as kb times log of some number of microstates omega is the uh, number of microstates of the system. Okay, so the fact that if you assume now that uh, black holes have entropy, okay, it must mean that black holes also have some microstate degrees of freedom. And second is if you assume that a black hole has entropy, then therefore it also has temperature. Okay, so black holes have a temperature, and in general, this temperature is non-zero. Now, both of these points seem paradoxical. From uh, the point of view of classical geo, okay, because if I look at statement A that a black hole should have microstates. In GR, we are just solving classical equations, okay, and we're saying that in the classical equations, okay, there there is nothing else that characterizes a black hole other than its mass, angular momentum, Q, uh, and so on. Okay, this is the Noether theorem. So at least from the outside, when I look at a black hole, I should not know anything else about the black hole except these quantities. Okay, that's all that I can study about the system. So, if there is some information, okay, then, okay, somehow it is not accessible on the outside, but possibly maybe it is inside the event horizon of the black hole, okay. So, you can say, okay, maybe possibly the information about microstates is hidden behind the horizon. And maybe we are taking our solutions of GR too seriously, okay, maybe when we cross the horizon, maybe uh, these GR solutions in some way break down. Again, we do not really expect them to break down, right, because if you expect for very big black holes, okay, we have seen that the curvature at the surface is nearly small, so it is nearly like flat space, okay. So as you are falling in, you do not expect anything unusual to happen at all, okay. It is just like you are going through a region of empty space, you should not perceive anything when you cross an event horizon. So, it is rather surprising that there would be any information hidden here. So, possibly when you get close to the singularity, maybe we do not know what happens at the singularity, okay, maybe there is some, some effects of quantum gravity, GR we know is incomplete, okay. So, maybe near the singularity, okay, there is something which is hiding all that information of the stuff that fell into the black hole, okay. But whatever it is, it is, it is hidden behind the horizon. So, at least from the outside, we never have to worry about this problem. And the second thing is, so, so now let us discuss the second point, okay, is why is a black hole having a temperature paradoxical, okay. So, if black holes have a temperature, Uh, T, then they must radiate, okay. This is what Hawking realized that if black holes have entropy, they have temperature and if they have temperature, then they must radiate, okay. And the reason they must radiate is if you imagine any system which has a temperature and you bring another system at a different temperature, okay, nearby, then if you allow these systems to come to thermal equilibrium, there is no physical process which is stopping things from, uh, from exchanging energy between these two. Then in the most general situation, okay, if this is the temperature of the environment, okay, if T environment is greater than T, okay, that is 
uh, the environment is hotter than the black hole, then energy should flow from the black hole to its surroundings. Sorry, should flow uh, from the surroundings to the black hole. Okay, if T is less than T environment, sorry, if T is greater than T environment, uh, then energy should flow. Uh, out from the black hole okay. and this is what you expect for example in Minkowski space like asymptotically Minkowski space which is vacuum is a zero temperature and if a black hole has temperature then it somehow that it has to radiate okay because the outside is colder okay and if the black hole has temperature it must somehow come to equilibrium with what is outside. And if T is equal to T environment then the energy is balanced. No, so there will be no net flow, but in all cases, okay, even when the energy is balanced or energy is flowing in, it is not like the energy is continuously flowing in, okay. This is a dynamic process where the black hole is sending some energy out, the environment is sending some energy in. The net effect is that on average, okay, so on average energy should flow in, okay, and on average energy should flow out here. And on average, energy is balanced. Okay, but at least in principle, it must be possible for the black hole to exchange energy with its environment both ways, not just take in, but also give out. Okay, energy. Okay, it might be more or less than what it absorbs. Okay, but it should be have a way of exchanging energy with the environment. Okay, however, in classical GR. the black holes are stable solutions. Okay. That is if I perturb them there will be some ripples, but it will ultimately settle into this kind of black hole like state. Okay. So, there is no extra radiation present nor can anything from anything from inside the event horizon uh, escape out of the black hole. Okay. So, an isolated black hole for example, like even a curved black hole which is isolated, I do not throw anything in, there is no Penrose process, how can anything come out? Okay. Uh, how can anything come out of, of this black hole? It is all vacuum, everywhere there is vacuum. Okay. So, this, this is the paradox of why black holes, why it is surprising that black holes have temperature from a classical GR perspective. Okay. But okay, now, what Hawking showed is that when we take into account the rules of quantum mechanics, black holes must radiate. Okay. Even Schwarzschild black holes will radiate. Okay, and if Schwarzschild black holes radiate, that means that their mass will decrease and therefore their area will decrease. So, this will actually be a violation okay, of the area theorem. The area of a black hole will actually be allowed to decrease. Okay. So, the area of a black hole will decrease, but if Bekenstein's law is right, the decrease in the area of the black hole is happening because the, the entropy of the environment is increasing. So, the entropy of the black hole goes down the entropy of the environment goes up because I am emitting radiation okay, out into the environment. So, the generalized second law will still hold or second law of thermodynamics. Okay. Uh, however, the area theorem of a black hole, an isolated black hole can still decrease its area. Okay. So, this is a violation of the area theorem. 
violation of area theorem, but consistent with uh, Bekenstein's generalized Okay, and let's let's just try to understand a heuristic picture, and we'll we're actually going to try and do uh, going to do a more quantitative calculation to reproduce Hawking's calculation. Okay, so heuristic picture looks something like this. Here's the horizon. Okay, so let's take a Schwarzschild black hole. This is at r is equal to r s. This is r. This is t. Okay, and uh, what you imagine is in quantum mechanics, or rather in quantum field theory. Okay, you can have particles pop in and out of the vacuum, okay, for a very short time. So you can have a pair of particle and antiparticles pop out of the vacuum, okay, then they annihilate, okay, and uh, this can happen in a very short time. And roughly speaking, this is because of the uncertainty principle, delta e, delta t, okay, is greater than equal to h bar. Okay, so for a very short time, you can create this tiny fluctuation of energy. And so the vacuum, okay, of uh, of quantum field theory is really constantly bubbling with these particles and antiparticles, which are constantly produced and then annihilate repeatedly. Okay. Now, what ha what can happen near the event horizon of a black hole is that you produce a particle and an antiparticle, but the particle, let's say, crosses into the event horizon. Okay. So this arrow. It the backwards arrow only represents it's an antiparticle. Okay, it doesn't mean it's going backwards. Okay, and uh, and now the thing is, once you pop them in and out, okay, of the vacuum like this, okay, then these particles, uh, the particles which cross into the event horizon, they can never escape back outside. The particles which you produce outside the event horizon, they can escape. So in this case, these vacuum fluctuations that are happening near the horizon lead to particles which are just outside the horizon being created and they escape to infinity. And how is energy conserved in this process? For this to become a real process, okay, like this, even though the energy violation can happen over a short duration, it cannot happen over a very large duration, okay, uh, over a very large time duration, okay, you cannot produce a very large amount of energy for a very large time duration. So the reason that it works over here is because if you look at the killing vector field, chi, uh, let's say, which is partial partial t outside the Schwarzschild horizon is time-like, okay, and chi dot p, okay, of the electron is, uh, is therefore uh, positive, sorry, is negative, okay, which means that the energy, which is minus chi dot p, okay, energy of the electron is positive. Uh, but the particle which crosses into the horizon, okay, this has a momentum minus p. Sorry, not not minus p. Okay, it's uh, uh, yeah, it has it has momentum. Uh, okay, let's just say it has momentum p. Okay, uh, and here what ha so the, so it's only the spatial parts of p that are reversed. Okay, the energy is uh, is at least when it's outside the horizon. So let me call this p prime chi dot p prime is greater than 0 when e uh, minus is outside the horizon. Okay, this is e, sorry, this is of the positron, this is of the electron. And this is uh, positive if the electron is outside, but once it crosses inside, okay, then this quantity becomes a negative. Uh, sorry, I, I should just say it that way. If it's produced inside, then e e is equal to minus chi dot p, if chi is space-like, okay, this can be negative. So this can be negative inside the horizon, okay. So I produce a particle with negative energy inside the horizon, okay, but of course this is not really the energy because chi is not a time-like killing vector field inside, okay, inside it's space-like. Still a killing vector field, it's only space-like. Uh, but chi dot p is the thing that is actually conserved for the particle, okay. And this can be negative, okay. And so therefore, you, it's essentially like you've effectively produced something of negative energy and something of positive energy, so that the total energy adds up to zero, okay. So this, even though the the total energy that I create is still zero, okay, and I can create it for a very, very, very long time, okay. 
So that means that I can really allow these particles to escape to infinity and this is what I measure as Hawking radiation. And Hawking's calculation basically shows that the radiation that comes out of this black hole has a temperature T which is equal to H bar kappa by C times 2 kappa. Okay, where kappa is the surface gravity. Okay. So the, that that is the result of Hawking's calculation. Okay, that that is what we are going to try to reproduce. Okay, so Hawking showed that in a semi classical approximation, okay, so why is it semi classical? It is you treat electrons and positrons as if they are quantum mechanical, okay, so you treat them in the framework of quantum field theory. But you treat the background geometry of um, of the metric okay, as a classical background. Okay. So this is the sense in which you have what is called a semi-classical approximation. Uh, we do not have a full theory of quantum gravity, okay. So, we do not know how to treat the full metric allowing for all possible variations of the metric. We know how to try to treat it perturbatively, okay. But when the fluctuations in the metric are very, very large, you have quantum mechanical fluctuations in the metric, we do not quite know how to treat those, okay. Uh, so, in this sort of semi classical approximation where you treat the background metric as some fixed thing, okay, which is given by the black hole, and then you treat electrons and positrons as some sort of uh, quantum fields in this background geometry, okay. That's that in that approximation, Hawking showed that this is what is semi classical black holes have a temperature T which is equal to H bar kappa by T by C. So, for a Schwarzschild black hole, we can calculate what this temperature is. So, T is sorry, uh, I think there is also a factor of Kb that I forgot to write down. Yeah, sorry, and the entropy should also be multiplied by a factor of Kb. Okay, anyway, so, uh, so T is H bar C over Kb. Uh, times kappa for a Schwarzschild is 1 over uh, uh, 4 g n, okay. So, we plug that in here and we get T is h bar c over kappa b 1 over 8 pi g n, okay. And this number if you work out what it is for a black hole of 1 solar mass, 6 into 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin times m solar by m, okay. So, the way to read this is if I plug in m is 1 solar mass, okay, which is approximately uh, 10 to the 30, 2 into 10 to the 30 kilograms. So, this ratio is 1 and the temperature of a black hole will be 6 into 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin, okay. And if I want to scale it, if it is 2 solar masses, the temperature of the black hole goes down by a factor of 4, okay. So, you see that the temperature of a black hole, okay, an astrophysical black hole that typically forms from the collapse of a star with the mass about that of the sun is very, very small, okay, it is 10 to the minus 8 Kelvin. Now, you compare this with the universe which is bathed in this light which is coming from the very early universe called the cosmic microwave background. And that light has a temperature of Kelvin, okay. This is light from the early universe. It is a very, very small temperature, okay, but it is coming from all around us and it is present everywhere, even in the region between galaxies, okay. So, you see that this temperature is so high compared to the temperature at which a typical astrophysical black hole would emit that there is no way, okay. And moreover, black holes they have accretion disk and they also the accretion disk is also emitting a lot of energy. 
Okay, so this energy that you get from this thermal emission, so the black body spectrum with this emission would be very, very low in intensity, okay. Barely, you, there is almost no hope of ever trying to measure this, okay. So, uh, in terms of actual implications for astrophysics, unless black holes, unless we, you know, we somehow discover black holes which were created in the early universe, these are called primordial black holes, uh, which were possibly created during inflation, okay, or uh, uh, in the very early instance of the universe and these black hole masses are very, 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 very tiny such that their temperature is very, very, very large, okay, you have almost no hope of ever trying to detect, okay, such, uh, such Hawking radiation. So, Hawking radiation, okay, uh, from this point of view is not something that we think about as pursuing a direction where we are thinking about what we can actually measure, but rather now we are trying to understand the mathematical consistency between quantum mechanics and general relativity. So, we are pursuing this further only to see what, what it implies for the consistency between quantum mechanics and general relativity, okay. So, uh, hopeless to measure this. Except maybe for very low mass primordial black holes if they exist. Okay, we do not even know if these objects exist. If they exist, okay, maybe you can measure the Hawking radiation from them. Help us to measure this for astrophysical black holes. Now, the next point is, so we started with two paradoxes, right. Uh, paradox one was black holes have entropy implies that they are microstates, okay. Microstates are forbidden by the no hair theorem, but maybe you can say, okay, maybe that information is hidden behind the horizon of the black hole. Uh, and the second paradox was black holes must have temperature if they have entropy and the question is how can they radiate. But this seems to be resolved because Hawking showed that if you in the semi classical approximation at least Hawking has shown uh, Q m in a semi in a classical GR background implies black holes radiate, uh, black holes have a temperature and can radiate. Okay. But actually this resolution, the fact that black holes can radiate actually makes the puzzle of the microstates worse, okay. So, how does it make it worse? So, you have a black hole, okay, it has some entropy. Uh, which means that there is some microstates. Okay. Uh, and now, if we assume that as the black hole uh, uh, radiates, uh, the Hawking formula. continues to be valid for all times. Okay. So, that is the temperature, let us say for Schwarzschild black hole is 1 over 8 pi g m. Okay. 
uh, the black hole radiates uh, and it is a black body like a black body with a temperature T. So, the power with which it radiates ok is like given by the Stefan Boltzmann law sigma times the area of the black hole times temperature to the fourth power ok. Uh, this is this is the power with which it radiates. The area of the black hole scales like m square ok. The temperature of the black hole scales as 1 over m to the 4 ok. So, this is uh, so the power of the black hole scales as 1 by m square ok. This is the power with which it radiates, but as it radiates its mass decreases ok. So, uh, so, this should should be a measure of the energy loss of the black hole ok. So, this is a measure of the energy loss of a black hole ok. So, this is dm by dt ok. So, so now if I just integrate, so I assume this formula continues to work at all times ok and therefore, what it tells me is that the black hole will completely evaporate in a time which roughly scales as m cube ok. And that m cube is basically, so this temperature is this evaporation time is called the page time and uh, this is the uh, approximately given by this over m Planck cube times p Planck ok, where I will write down this formula for m Planck. m Planck is uh, a mass scale that you can construct from the constants of g, h bar and c ok and uh, so I will write down the Planck length which is g, h bar c cube uh, the square root of this ok. This is the Planck length. Yeah, and uh, the uh, Planck mass is given by uh, h bar over c times the Planck length, okay, which is uh, two into ten to the minus five grams. Okay, the Planck length is about ten to the minus thirty-three centimeters, and uh, the Planck time is uh, C times L Planck, which is roughly uh, 5 into 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Okay. So, when I plug in these numbers in here, okay, what you get is the evaporation time of a black hole is for a solar mass black hole is 10 to the 71 seconds ok. And that is a huge time because the age of the universe at present which is 13 billion years is about 4 into 10 se to the 7 seconds sorry 10 to the 17 seconds ok. So, uh, 1 second is uh, 1 10 to the 7 seconds is approximately 1 year ok. So, the age of the universe is very small but at least in principle black holes should evaporate ok. So, the Hawking radiation means the temperature of a black hole is very low ok when the black hole is very massive and so it takes a long time for the radiation to leak out. But in principle if I wait long enough a black hole should radiate ok and radiate away completely ok. And uh, and now uh, this leads to a problem once the black hole has fully radiated away its energy. ok. Then there is no horizon left ok. So, if you continue to assume that this Hawking formula holds in the page time the black hole should completely evaporate and then at the end of it you should have no horizon left ok behind. So, behind which the microstates were hiding So, now the only thing that you are left with 
in the universe is Hawking radiation. Okay, and uh, if the only thing that I'm left with is Hawking radiation, and the Hawking radiation is purely thermal, okay, as Hawking's calculation seems to indicate. And if the Hawking radiation is purely thermal, okay, then we will lose all the information that went in to forming the black hole. Yeah, okay, sorry, uh, I guess this point is, is not completely obvious, so let me explain what I mean, okay. So, imagine that we dropped stuff in and formed a black hole, okay. So, we had a lot of stuff, we dropped it and we formed a black hole. Now, all of this stuff was, let's say, some kind of gas, okay, when it was far away and this gas had some entropy, okay. This entropy is a measure of the information, okay. Uh, if the entropy goes to 0, that means that the gas is some very perfectly ordered well known state, okay. And there is no information there because you know exactly what state it is, there is no uncertainty there, okay. So, all the stuff that you drop into the black hole, okay, uh, is basically now uh, encoding this entropy of the gas, okay. Now, since the generalized second law holds, okay, you will get some entropy of this black hole you get some entropy of this black hole. Now, when you calculate the entropy of this black hole, this entropy of the black hole actually turns out to be very large, okay. For a solar mass black hole, uh, this entropy is, uh, so if I calculate what this is, this is A over 4 as measured in Planck units, okay, where L Planck G H bar over C cube. So, this is the formula for the entropy of a black hole. It is the area of a, bla of a black hole as measured in Planck units divided by uh, a quarter, okay, a quarter of the area. So, this itself, L Planck itself is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. So, again for a solar mass black hole of radius 3 kilometers, okay, the area is 4 pi times 3 kilometers square times 10 to the minus 33 centimeters square by 4, okay, into yeah, uh, okay, into m over m solar square because the area of a Schwarzschild black hole goes as mass. So, 3 kilometers is 3 into 10 to the 5 centimeters, okay. So, that is 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, divided by 10 to the minus 66, so 10 to the 77, okay. So, that is 10 to the 77. Okay, yeah, so it seems right. So, this entropy of the black hole actually turns out to be quite enormous because uh, you should think of this as the log of the number of microstates, okay, of the system. So, what we are saying is that this system has 10 to the 77 microstates, right, or e to the 77 uh, microstates. We do not know what these are, these are somehow hidden behind this horizon of the black hole, okay. Whereas, the radiation that comes out of this black hole, okay, is at some Hawking temperature, which is actually very low as the mass is very large, okay. Uh, and so, the radiation that comes out when you calculate what its entropy is, okay, so typically for any kind of gas, okay, the entropy will scale like, uh, for example, uh, for a gas of photons. Uh, for example, the entropy scales, entropy density scales as temperature to the fourth power, okay. So, what you see is that, that this entropy that comes out, okay, entropy of the radiation that comes out will actually be very small, 
okay, as as the initial radiation is leaking out, okay, and even at the end, okay, when the mass of the black hole is very small, you still will not get a lot of entropy coming out in Hawking radiation, okay. So the entropy that leaks out in Hawking radiation. is very small, okay, whereas the entropy of the black hole that you started with was very big, okay. So the question is that you seem to have lost all that information that went into forming this black hole, okay. So where did that information go, okay, as the black hole is evaporated, okay. And this information is fine grained information fine grained entropy, which means it is not parameterizing a degree of uncertainty, but it is fundamentally like a quantum mechanical entropy of the system, okay. And uh, if quantum mechanics is unitary, okay, then entropy should be exactly preserved uh, in black hole evaporation. Okay. So the puzzle is the so called black hole information paradox. Okay. Which is that once the black hole evaporates, you can no longer appeal to the fact that the information in the black hole was hidden behind that horizon, okay. Somehow that information seems to have disappeared, okay, if the Hawking radiation is purely thermal. Okay, so uh, probably we won't have time to discuss more more about the information paradox. So if we have some time, we'll talk about the information paradox. But what we will actually focus on, our main focus for this course or for the next uh, four lectures at least, is to show uh, Hawking's formula for the black hole temperature, okay. So we learn how to do quantum field theory in curved space time and then we will show that black holes actually radiate, okay. And actually we are going to do something even simpler, we are not really going to even calculate the temperature of a black hole, what we will do is we will realize that objects falling into a big black hole, okay, are nearly Minkowski, okay. So in the sense that if you are a freely falling observer, okay, falling past the event horizon, if the black hole horizon is big enough, tidal forces are very small and you are nearly like a Minkowski observer, an inertial observer in Minkowski space time. So what we'll draw is we'll draw this analogy between black hole near ge the near geometry of a black hole, near event horizon geometry, and the geometry of Minkowski spacetime. Okay, and so, if black holes have an event horizon in Minkowski space time, you have your Rindler horizon. And the freely falling observers who enter the black hole are like the inertial observers 
of Minkowski spacetime. Who see nothing unusual, okay? So an inertial observer just crosses this Rindler horizon, nothing happens, just normal, they just static, nothing unusual is happening for them, okay? However, a static observer outside a black hole, okay? So if I draw the Penrose diagram for a short shell, So a static observer is one who is just floating outside the horizon at r is equal to r s plus an epsilon. This static observer has to accelerate really hard to stay where they are, okay. In Minkowski space time that someone who is just skirting the Rindler horizon is an accelerating observer, okay, who goes like this, who is just skirting the horizon. So in this case the analogy is in Minkowski space time you are talking about a Rindler observer. So if you are just floating outside the event horizon of a Schwarzschild black hole, you are actually more like a Rindler observer, okay. And the freely falling observer, uh, here at least, the inertial observer sees a vacuum. Okay, and here the freely falling observer who is like the inertial observer will see a vacuum. Okay. But we have argued that static observers, observers outside the black hole, okay, as we will argue from uh, Hawking's result, uh, they see that the black hole has a temperature T equal to uh, H bar by C, kappa by T pi. Uh, and KD also, okay. And the Rindler observer therefore should also see, should also see uh, a thermal bath of particles. And it turns out that they will measure so even though you imagine that you are an accelerating observer in Rindler space, uh, sorry in Minkowski space time, this acceler accelerating observer will measure a temperature which is h bar by c k b times your acceleration by 2 pi, okay. That is rather remarkable to think about, okay, because if you think about it we are accelerating observers, okay. We are standing on the surface of the earth, the earth itself uh, is accelerating, okay around the sun, okay, we are accelerating because we are not freely falling, okay. So we should also be seeing this thermal bath, except that this temperature is so, so, so tiny, okay, that is very hard to detect, okay. So the claim is that if black holes can have a temperature, even accelerating observers in Minkowski space time should detect a temperature and this temperature is called the Unruh temperature. Okay. And so, in the rest of this class, we are not actually going to derive the Hawking formula, rather we are going to derive this, which is in a much more simple space time, okay, which is in flat space time, but looking at Rindler observers, we will argue that uh, accelerating observers measure a temperature and this temperature is h bar by c k b a over 2 pi, where a is the acceleration, okay. So the goal of what we are going to do is to derive the Unruh temperature, okay, to show that there is such an effect and that uh, you will measure this temperature, okay. So that is the plan for the next uh, four or five classes, okay. We will stop here. Any questions?